On this episode of Dual Survival. You all right? Yeah. Teamwork's essential as Cody and Joe struggle to escape the Nicaraguan jungle. You okay? But tempers get hot when survival tactics collide. I know he's not that big, but it's food and I'm hungry. You gonna eat it raw? No, I'm not gonna eat it raw, I'm gonna build a fire. We're not sure if we're gonna get fire. I'll make a fire. I'm hungry, I'm gonna eat this thing. And Cody applies an old remedy. We could use this as a suture. To Joe's new wound. <laughs> that hurt? No, it freaking tickles. Stranded at the top of a steep, muddy volcano, nearly a mile high above sea level. Whoa, 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 oh, God. Outdoor survival skills instructor Cody Lundin and 20-year special ops veteran Joe Teddy. Two guys with two completely opposing survival philosophies will show how to descend a sloping jungle landscape. This is effed up, man. And make it out alive. Let's this get this, let's get this is over with. I don't need banter from you right now. Nicaragua, Central America's largest country and home to the dual volcanoes of Ometepe Island. On one side, Madeiras. On the other, Concepcion. These volcanic twin peaks play host to some of the harshest jungle terrain known to man. You've got poisonous snakes. You've got poisonous spiders. You've got trees with thorns on them that are three inches long. The terrain is unforgiving. You can die of hypothermia at the top and hyperthermia at the bottom. It's extremely prehistoric. This is mother nature on steroids. Every year, Hundreds of adventure hikers seek to ascend the steep, muddy hills and drop-offs, which get more and more treacherous the further up they climb, often with disastrous results. You're at a constant angle. Your hips are hurting, your knees are hurting, your ankles are hurting because there's no flat area. Six people have died in the last three years. Hundreds of people have been lost. In this scenario, after making it to the summit of Madeiras, Two hikers become disoriented and separated in the thick canopy jungle. You get spun around a little bit, you start walking over here, walking over there. Before you know it, you have no idea where you're at. To make matters worse, one yeah. has fallen into a ravine and dislocated his kneecap. This scenario is one of my personal worst nightmares. You're on a volcano, one of your party gets injured, and you have to navigate through several different bioregions of crazy jungle to get rescued. It's a huge, frankly, scenario. Right now, Cody and I are separated. My very first priority is to find him. Cody! You should never split up unless absolutely positively you have to do it. Cody! In a situation like this, you can use a very simple military term, gotwa. Where I'm going, when I'm coming back, and what to do if I don't come back. They didn't do it, and now that idiot has put the onus on his buddy to come find him and get him out of the situation he's in. Joe Teddy is a 20-year special ops veteran and is highly trained in the art of tactical tracking operations. What I'm doing right now is I'm looking for ground spore or aerial spore. Ground spore is any impression left on the ground, either by the foot or any other part of the body that's showing that that person's been there. There's aerial spore as well, which are broken branches, discolored leaves, maybe he touched something that turned over that doesn't quite match the scenery. For the past 10 years, he has used this unique skill to hunt down, capture, and kill Taliban and Al-Qaeda forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay, here's what I'm talking about. Here's a perfect shape of a heel. And remember, the guy I'm tracking does not have shoes on. That is exactly what I'm looking for. That's a perfect example of ground spore. He's gone this way, without a doubt. Half a mile away, on the volcano's western slope, Outdoor survival instructor Cody Lundin has taken the role of the other lost hiker, whose situation went from bad to worse when he tumbled down a ravine and dislocated his knee. If you find yourself in a wilderness situation and you're injured, the first thing you're gonna do is assess the injury. Before you can do that, you've gotta chill out. Your heart rate is gonna be up, everything's gonna be going 90 miles an hour, your adrenaline's gonna be rushing through your body. Chill out, get your bearings, then see what works. So I have the three components I need for this splint. I have the splint itself out of bamboo. 
I have my wrap that I've cut into six pieces to lash on the splint. And to pad the voids, I have the Spanish moss. It's hard to imagine the trauma that one would go through bending or moving to get this thing done, but I'm gonna have to do what I'm gonna have to do in rock and roll. Hiking ranks third in the number of injuries reported each year for outdoor recreational activities. More than a quarter of those injuries involve the legs. Oh man, that's luxurious. This is Porsche 911 Carrera. Bucket seats, leather, tinted windows. That feels good. This is a huge oh. challenge, and what's scary is, look at this. This is a devastating psychological blow to anyone who's injured in the wilderness when they realize, okay, injury stabled, my God, re-injury pending. This is real rough turf. You'd want to be on the salt flats with an injury like this. All right, look, he either went left or right. There is no way that somebody has walked through here. There'd be broken branches here and here. There are none. Boom, I'm gonna immediately look to my right. As a matter of fact, I think I see something. Following even the slightest hint of ground and aerial spore can lead a trekker one step closer to finding the person he seeks. Another example of aerial spore, this has just recently been broken. And if you can look right here, either he slipped and his hand hit this or his foot, this moss has been broken off. And here's one small piece of this tree, which is fresh. Somebody or something has been through here. It's gotta be him, it's very fresh. I know him on the track. A lot of local people here do make whistles out of bamboo. So I'm gonna separate this from the mother plant. I'm gonna try making a whistle with this one. Now that my injury is stabilized, I wanna be found. I'm not really gonna hike out here on my own. So I wanna be as visible as possible, make as much noise as possible to bring someone to me. So I'm gonna take this material, I'm gonna blow on the end, and I'm just gonna pinch it, and we'll see what kind of noise I can get out of it. Making a mechanical device to create audio signals has distinct advantages over relying on one's vocal cords to yell for help. That sounds like a dying duck, but better than yelling. The amplitude and range of the human voice will diminish as it becomes stressed, whereas the mechanical device will remain consistent through long periods of stress. Universal sign of distress is three. I want to give it a half a second or so in between beep, beep, beep. I don't want to sound like some exotic bird out here. I want to sound like, what the hell is that repetitive thing that doesn't sound natural? If you're not making an effort to be found, you're already freaking dead. When you're in a wilderness situation and you're lost or injured, it's usually a third party rescue. And in this case, it's Joe. Cody! Cody! Yeah. You all right? Well, I've been better, but I'm all right. In special operations, you don't leave anybody behind, ever. Whoever shows up to the party comes home. Hey, can you see any way down besides right here? Because I can't see over this ledge. If you can catch that big root system coming down, you can bear hug it. There's a little ledge right at the base of that smaller tree, which you can anchor off on. Then continue to bear hug that root system down to a second ledge where there's a backpack. I can see the backpack now. All right, don't have, really have a choice. <laughs> Let me tell you something, when you can't see your hand holds below you or your feet holds, that'll put a sphincter factor of about 10 on you. That's that mother root, the one you're straddling. You okay? Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, just hold on. Some of the dry 
and it looks like it's alive, but it's not. Climb down a cliff, I'm trying to find handholds. I get my feet underneath me, and the first thing I go to grab is a branch, and it breaks. Biggest thing when climbing, you always have to have three points of contact on a cliff, whether it's two hands and a foot or two feet and a hand. And I did. So that saved me right there. Cody, I want to throw this thing down. Yeah, is there a just soft right spot? down here. There's a soft leaves right below where you're standing. We need to get that backpack. It could be a map exactly to where we need to go. So we need to get that gear to help us on our journey. Perfect. All right. You're looking at probably 14 feet down. All right. You can stay in that track. You've got big roots on either side. There's going to be a good handhold coming up by your left foot. All right. Now by your left knee. Got it. God, dude. <laughs> but I, was, I thought you were going to come tumbling down from up there. Good job. Oh, whew. Well, That's a badass split. Yeah, I mean, I, I did the best I can with what I could, like you did on the climb. I'm pretty impressed with Cody's splint. With what he had to use and materials here, he did an outstanding job. Let's see, we got this damn thing. We got flashlight, but it don't work. Oh, it does. It does work. Oh, nope. Look at that bulb loose. The flashlight we're for sure keeping if we need something at night. Plastic bag. The sandwich bag is a container. Hunting and gathering cultures revolved around container use. Never throw away a plastic bag that's in good shape. What the hell is this thing, a mint tin or something? The mint tin is a container, and that's a container that can be put over a fire without burning up. All right, I think that's it. So a mint tin, an empty plastic baggie, and a, flashlight and a, a D-cell flashlight. Yep. These things are going to evolve as we move. I really don't uh, know what I'm going to use each one for, but the situation will present itself. The summit of Madera stretches up nearly a mile from the base of Ometepe Island. Okay. With Cody's right leg completely immobilized, there is no chance that he can descend its thick jungle landscape before dark. We're going straight down here. We're going down there. Yep. That's the only way to go. This way is steeper. That is impossible. Priority has now become finding a suitable place to make camp for the night and a water source for rehydration. Okay. Good. I don't have mobility, and I'm burning up nope. this thing. Here. Let me put it in the pack. Yep. Right now, Cody is definitely in a deficit. We've got to come together as a team, find a way to get him down here safely and me safely, and come out the other end alive. Let's check this vine out. Where? It looks like a water vine here. Oh, bro, I could definitely use some water. Sure. I'm getting a little bit of a headache, actually. Do you have any experience with these? Actually, uh, yeah. In, in Okinawa, Japan, I was stationed there for nine months. They had huge mines and tons of water could fill up your entire mouth. Water-bearing jungle vines generally have rough bark and are about five centimeters thick. But not all vines contain drinkable water. Some contain a noxious milky sap that is extremely bitter to the taste and can cause irritation if contacted by skin. Finding the right vines for water is mostly an exercise in trial and error. Anything? A few drops. Take whatever you can get. Each drop counts. Let's put it in the crotch of this tree so we have gravity on our go side. Ahead. There we go. A little bit more. Hopefully, we'll find some better ones. Take some in. You know, even psychologically, even a little bit of water, get that. Even a little bit of water will psychologically get your head back in the game. Because that actually was, like, beautiful. I've got a few drops. We're not here in the rainy season. We're at the very beginning of it. If we were here three or four months later, there'd be a ton of water. Let's hope they produce better than this. Yeah. That, that ain't gonna cut it. No. While Joe continues the recon for a suitable campsite, Cody searches the vines for ones that may contain more water. Dehydration doesn't simply happen in the desert. In this case, when the humidity is over 70%, the evaporative quality of the sweat on the skin doesn't work anymore. This is going to be a long, long day, okay, but every drop counts. Hopefully, we'll find some vines that produce a little bit more than this. These are the stingy species of vines. Cody! Yeah, over here. What'd you find? Let me uh, give you a quick sit rep and let you know what's going on. Sit? Why are we doing sit-ups? No, sit rep. I don't know what that means. Situation report. Kind of like give you an idea of what's going on. Oh. Uh, anyway, there's cliff. Where, where, where have you been? Huh? Look at your arms. 
Yeah. What happened there? Well, dude, there's black palm. And it's literally like three inch needles sticking out of trees and they're black and they don't bend. They look really cool in a way. Oh it? yeah, real cool. It, it burns like hell from my sweat. We'll have to deal with that one later. So what did you find? What we have, cliff all the way along to our right. It's not cliff to our left, but it's too steep for you to navigate. We're just gonna follow this finger straight down. It's gonna get thicker, but there's okay. nothing you can do, man. You have to suck it up. Well, here, here, here have some water. Is that all from the vine? Yeah, that's it from the vine. But see how the bag is compromised uh. in here? It's dripping. There's a little pinhole here and here. This is now just a collector. It's not a container because it's screwed up. So unfortunately, we can't carry anything in this. So you get first bottoms up. With their only container compromised, Cody and Joe will have to hydrate as much as they can before setting out to build a shelter for the night. Go ahead and chug it. I've had my share. You sure? Yeah, chug it up. Better in your body than in the baggie. If you're caught in a dehydration situation, any amount of water is huge. Even if it's a little bit, your mind is already in a better place because you think you're going to be saving yourself. That's the best my nature can do. Nope, that'll work. At least it keeps it yep. clean, eh? That's good. Now hydrated and with a temporary bandage applied to Joe's largest cut, they can begin the rigorous descent down the side of Madeiras towards civilization. Good. Good. It's going to get a little bit steeper right here, so slow the pace down. Watch out for that hole. Whoa, check this out. Look at this. Huh? Look at these leaf cutter ants. It's amazing how they can freaking carry that kind of weight. Yeah. Check this out. Yep. Look at this monster. Look at that. That's the ant head. That's He's got ant. some pinchers on him. Yep. This is the oldest suture on the planet. The soldiers, the big bad boys of the leaf cutters that guard everyone else, they're known for really whopper mandibles. And I know that in ancient times, they were used as sutures by a lot of native peoples. This is a soldier ant for the leaf cutters. You're a soldier for the US. You want to meet soldier to soldier? We'll suture that. Wow. I'm looking at this ant walking on the ground with these giant choppers. I'm like, you want to suture me with that thing? Are you kidding me? Look at your arms. Yeah. What happened there? There's black palm, and it's literally like three inch needles sticking out of trees, and they're black, and they don't bend. Any breach of skin tissue in a hot and humid jungle environment opens the door for infection and sepsis, which can be fatal without proper medical attention. Whoa, check this out. Look at these leaf cutter ants. We could use this as a suture. Mm -hmm. Take it on both sides of your wound. It's going to clamp down on your flesh. All right. And then I'll just pinch off the body, and we'll hold that wound shut. I'll give this a whirl. Have you done this before? No. no. Great. I know you can use maggots for cleaning out wounds and debriding wounds, but I never knew you could use an ant to suture a wound. Never heard of it before. There we go. Ooh. Oh. Does that hurt? No, it freaking tickles, dude. Definitely you ready pretty... for a couple more? Yeah. Just okay. get it done, man. This okay. is like something to stand around and do all day. This thing hurts like hell. It's like a bee sting, but you can actually feel the ant clamping down, almost like a staple. And as it's doing it, it's stinging you like a bee. Oh, he's not cooperating. Oh, 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 yeah, baby. Once they bite on, they don't let go. You can physically pull their body away from their head, and they will stay embedded in flesh. One more soldier for the soldier. All right, go ahead. You know, I stitched myself up one time in Iraq. This was completely different. But I have to admit, in the field, you have to do what you have to do, and this worked. Well, let's put that leaf back yep. on. Using an ant to suture, that was a first, for sure. I didn't know there were ants with pinchers that big. The size does matter. In this case, it does. All right, I'm good to go, man. That's tight. Still nearly a mile high on the western slope of Madeiras, the search for a suitable camp for the night remains a priority. The real problem is the crap on the ground. It's like walking through a, someone's entrails, you know? Yep. In a thick jungle plagued by overgrown vines and plants with three-inch long spikes, movement in the dark would not be an option for a pair of hikers with no injuries. 
but Cody's immobilized right leg makes the situation for him and Joe even more desperate. We've got a nice clearing here. I think we may be able to find something here to shelter for the night, Cody. Well, yeah, I mean, we gotta stop at some point. This area is not really a good camping area at all, but it's better than what we walk through. The only time you get a perfect shelter location is on page 27 of someone's survival book, and it's usually a line drawing because it doesn't exist. To me, this is a bad right here. All right. Anytime I can have nature work for me, you know, I'm gonna do that. We've got banana leaves over here, and I know there's some bamboo over there. I can definitely rig some kind of shelter for the night. Don't go too far now. All right. What I'm looking for is some thatching for our roof. And these huge banana leaves right here are perfect. That's exactly what I'm looking for. With an abundance of resources in a small area, Joe gathers all he needs to build a bamboo and thatched roof shelter in a short amount of time. These are way above normal in size, and that's exactly what I want. I'm gonna let nature do my work for me. Instead of cutting down 20 of the small ones, I can cut down 10 of these. Banana leaves can grow up to eight feet tall in Nicaragua, <laughs> making them the perfect material for roof building. <sighs> this is like nature shingles. This is exactly what we need in case it starts raining. I need about 10 or 15 more of those. Ironically, we have the leaf cutters here again, right in front of our little shelter. I'm gonna do the same thing there. I'm gonna go gather leaves in Joe's shirt, try to fill some of the voids with the leaves that are all over the place, maybe pat it off with some Spanish moss. I'm not used to being a third wheel, so it's a real ego blow to be gimped up. So I'm doing whatever I can. I can gather the dried leaves that are all proximal and try to make myself as useful as possible for my partner, because frankly, He's busting his butt running all over the jungle, getting stuff that would take me way too long to do and that would be dangerous in my situation. What I'm gonna do right now is gonna gather some bamboo to make our shelter. As you can see, there's tons of it around here. This is exactly what I'm looking for. For shelter building, one would be hard pressed to find a stronger, more versatile material than bamboo. With a tensile strength superior to many alloys of steel, bamboo is the strongest growing woody plant on Earth. We're very lucky to have all of these resources close by. These things are within arm's reach of us. Unfortunately, I don't have a hammer and nails that Mother Nature is going to supply that. I'm going to use vines to tie everything together. Now, check this out. You have an area that an animal, without a doubt, has been walking through here. I mean, you can look at the ground's been pushed down. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this piece of bamboo, and I'm going to make a V-trap. Basically, I'm going to split it and use the kinetic energy of getting back to its original form to snare the animal. Cody and I are tired, and we need to replenish our calories. This is a target of opportunity I cannot let go by. Here's an opportunity for me to put a trap to work for me. And you know, I might get lucky. The average person burns about 90 calories per hour by simply walking. Vigorous activity at high altitude can easily turn that number into 500 calories per hour. We've got to find some kind of food. And I'm not talking about eating plants. We need some protein to give us some energy. Without those calories to fuel our bodies, we are going to get weaker and weaker, and we're both going to become casualties. The trick is to split this all the way down to about right here. The idea is to split the bamboo put a twig in between it, hang the bait off of it. As the animal takes the bait, the bamboo will slap shut and snap its neck. The two pieces come together. We'll definitely, we'll definitely catch it. I need a trigger in here, which I can make with another piece of bamboo. But what I need is a piece of string. What I am gonna use, and I can have on my shoes at all time, is 550 cord on my boots. These right here, I've replaced this with military grade 550 cord. And inside of it, there are seven filaments. Each one holds 50 pounds, plus the casing, which holds 200 pounds. 50 times seven, 350 plus 200, 550 cord. Paracord, or 550 cord, was first used by the US military during World War II in the suspension lines of parachutes. There's the filaments inside the 550 cord. I'm gonna gut my shoelaces, and I'm gonna use that to make the string for the, uh, for the trap. 
Once on the ground, paratroopers found it useful in almost any situation where light cordage was needed, such as attaching equipment to harnesses and vehicle racks. And there you have it. And if you look, you will see seven separate filaments. Each one holds 50 pounds. You could set out 20 traps and not catch anything, or you could set out one and get something. But I can tell by looking at this trail, this animal has been by here recently, and I would say within the last six to eight hours. This is the trigger. I'm gonna use an end of line bowling to attach a wild grape that I found as bait. You can definitely smell this. It's extremely pungent. It's very juicy. Anything in this area, it'll smell it for sure. Bamboo is extremely strong. When you separate it, it goes right back to the way it was with a lot of force. Right there. Don't even sneeze. Trap set is good to go. I've got to get back. The sun's going down. Cody's waiting for me, and we got a shelter to make. Okay, what we have right here, as you can see, and he's a little pissed off, is a common variety vine snake. They are venomous, so I'm not gonna mess with them. Look at his camouflage. I mean, he looks exactly like a vine. The venomous green vine snake inhabits central and parts of South America and can grow up to six and a half feet long. It uses its venom to immobilize small mammals before consuming them. Wow, first time I ever saw one of those. He's small. But I'll tell you what, you gotta respect the jungle. You can't be messing around with something like this. You could react to anaphylactic shock like that from something like that. So I've never been bit by a snake and I don't plan on getting bit by one. So he's moving and uh, I'm moving in the other direction for sure. Ometepe Island, Nicaragua, nearly 3,000 feet above sea level. On the western slope of a volcano called Maderas, Joe and Cody prepare a shelter for their first night in the thick jungle landscape. I plan on building a simple lean-to. We're both exhausted. I want something just to keep the rain off of us if it rains tonight. A couple support beams and some big leaves across the top, done. Check out the size of these leaves, man. Wow, that's <laughs> a huge score. How can you argue with easy to cut bamboo, jungle vine that's already cordage, and big ass leaves? It's fairly simple to make a framework, boom, thatch it over, and you're a done deal. Ready for another piece, right? Yes, sir. OK, incoming. In this scenario, Cody has immobilized his right leg to mimic one of the most common injuries to hikers in this kind of terrain, a dislocated kneecap, making their descent towards civilization much more complicated. Do we need any more in the backside here? That looks pretty good from what I can see here. What we need to do is put a piece of bamboo on the back of these just to make sure they hold down. All right. What happened? V-trap has snared an agouti, a type of rodent found in South and Central America and the West Indies. Agoutis are valued for their meat and considered a luxury food in Nicaragua. That trap, no doubt, broke its neck. It was already dead when I came up, or I gave it a good whack. What the hell's that? <laughs> it's an agouti? What's goody about it? No, agouti, agouti. I mean, I know he's not that big, but it's food, and I'm hungry. Are you going to eat Let's... it raw? No, I'm not going to eat it raw. I'm going to build a fire. <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> Cody, all you got to do is build a fire. I thought you'd be, like, ecstatic that we got some food to I am here. psyched, and I don't want to piss on your parade, but we we are. We're, not, we're not sure if we're going to get fire. Well, you're the master of fire. Let, let's see you do your magic, brother. With with what? I mean, we haven't we haven't really so, discussed that. You know what? That. I'll make a fire. I'm hungry. I'm gonna eat this thing, and you, I'll share it with you. But I'll make a fire. We're gonna eat this. Cody's been doing this for a long time. But you know what? I have my own ideas and my own philosophies. We don't have any matches. Everything here is moist. The only thing that I am thinking of right now is using the flashlight somehow to make a fire. So the first thing I got to do is get the bulb out. 
I've got an idea that it's going to be a one-shot deal. What we're going to do is I'm going to take the flashlight bulb out. We've got to break it without breaking the filament. Use the filament to start an amber to start a fire. OK. Here's the killer, though. You've got to break the glass on the bulb without breaking the filament. Incandescent light bulbs house a filament of very fine tungsten wire through which an electric current is passed. Once the current is activated, the filament typically heats up to between 3,000 and 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Let me put this back in here so we don't lose all the pieces, because the flashlight's got to work. That's the whole idea. All right. Here's what we need right now is a flat rock, and I'll use my knife to break the glass without breaking the filament, but it's got to be flat. I need a rock, something hard. Well, I'm not going to hobble no. around and look I'll for a rock. Tell you what, so. hold this. Let me go find one. OK. Finding a dry enough fuel source for the tinder is going to be challenging, even for an experienced fire maker like Cody. Fire is one of the four sacred elements for a reason. Not only is it an awesome tool and you can do billions of things with it, it's a big psychological hug. So in this state, if you were out tracked with your buddy in a wilderness scenario, and you could get fire in a safe setting where you didn't burn down the jungle, it's a huge psychological boost to survival, and that is everything in a stress situation. What I'm doing is I'm taking down and stripping this inner fiber, and I'm anchoring the base, and I'm making the typical bird's nest. There's my framework, and I have a little pocket there that I'll fill with the sweet stuff. I don't know what's gonna happen with this ignition source. Either it flames up, like if we had a match. Also, it could just ember out like if it was done with a bow drill or a hand drill. Since I don't know what the heat source is going to look like, I got a plan for A and I got a plan for B. Bringing back food is a good thing if it's edible and it's not in this state. So the pressure is on Joe to make this fire. This is the rock I need. Otherwise, that agouti ain't so goody. This is extremely delicate. I've got one shot to do this right. Bases are loaded, Joe's at bat. I've got to be focused on what I'm doing because there's no second chance. It's real. The, I believe the filament is still there. As a matter of fact, it is. All right, that's what we need right there. Got to be very, very careful. That's that filament is thinner than a hair by at least half. All right. Contained inside a sealed oxygen-free glass bowl. A tungsten filament will retain its heat for as long as it is being fed an energy source. Once that thing flames, I'm going off of your frigging brother. But I don't know what's going to happen, and that makes me nervous. This is going to work, bro. Have the faith. You ready to rock and roll? Yep. On the count of three, the snipers pull their trigger. One, two, boom. Right. All right. This is the proverbial one-shot deal on this. This tiny little filament is going to glow for a fraction of a second. If we don't transfer that heat, into the cotton on my wrap, we ain't getting fire. It's that simple. One, two, three. On a volcanic island in Nicaragua, Joe and Cody have only one chance to make fire by transferring the heat from an exposed light bulb filament you ready to rock and roll? Which will burn out in less than a second once the flashlight is powered. On the count of three, the snipers pull their trigger. One, two, boom. Right. One, two, three. Start ripping that up. Start putting it right over this. Come on, Cody, do your thing, brother. More 
Got it. Let me put it on. Got it. Keep ripping it up. <sighs> Come here, here, look, look, look. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Woo! We're not out of the Yeah, yet. baby. Hold on. Here. Put it on. Don't crush it. Oh, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> yeah. Mission accomplished. We've got fire. Congratulations. Dude, outstanding <laughs> job, man. I told you I hate to lose. You ready to eat this thing? You betcha. Mmm. That's a goody. Oh, bro. That is tasty. That's really good. I needed that. I'll get right down here. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm just getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. And they're itchy as hell. I was looking at these plants over here. See that one right above that kind of deadish log up there? That's actually a natural bug spray, bug repellent. Oh, for so real? let's grab some of that Yes, for sure. Go. Want to take it up by the root or just? No, 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 no. You just don't need to leaves? kill the plant. Just All take right. the leaves off it. Let it continue to grow. All right. The peeper plant can be used as a topical insect repellent. You can actually put it in your mouth, chew it up, and apply it as a poultice, or just rip the leaves up and put it topically on the skin. It has a real pungent odor. As I said, just grab a, grab a leaf, smell it. Take it in your hand and smell it. Oh, wow. It's good stuff. Very aromatic. Yeah. I put that peeper plant on my leg and my bites as an insect repellent. But after 15 seconds of putting that stuff on, it actually reduced the amount of itching. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 28, 29, 30. <laughs> I got, uh... Yeah, 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 whatever. None. Dude, how in the hell could you not have your feet getting bit? You don't even wear freaking shoes. I'm not providing habitat for them. It's a nice, moist, dark habitat. Hammer, 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 hammer. With me, they got like the desert. <sighs> Over centuries, Ometepe Island has evolved into a landscape of tangled vines dense thickets and steep, muddy drop-offs. Oh, yeah. What we have right here is a drainage drill. We come to this drainage trail, and this thing cuts right through the jungle like a knife through butter. This is exactly what we've been looking for. This is our way out of the jungle. Holy man. Can you get down this? It depends on how good our teamwork is. Is that stuff slick? That moss? Not really, but I'm not walking barefoot either. Clearly, anyone who's dealing with an injured party in a wilderness setting has to be ultra careful. I don't know what's in store for us, you know, another 100 and 200 feet, because I can't see, but this is a perfect trail out of here. Any sort of terrain challenges need to be taken on very, very methodically, slowly, and ultra careful. There's only one way to find out if I can do this, and that's to try it. For two able-bodied men, Descending a steep drainage trail is a grueling and dangerous proposition. I want to be on you okay. totally here in a little bit. Yep. OK. You good? I'm good. But with one injured party, it is an excruciatingly slow and painful exercise in coordination and teamwork. If you can get your left foot on this rock, it'll be good to go. Yeah, this is no problem. Nope, good. When you're working as a team, communication is paramount. You have got to know what the right hand is doing and what the left hand is doing. If he's leaning forward and I'm leaning back and he goes to grab for me, he's going down. Here. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, that's moving through this terrain. You're at war. This is a very violent environment. <sighs> Holy <laughs> We come around this bend and I look and all I see is Cliff. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, if I wasn't in a splint, I would still say, Oh, crap. But being immobilized, looking down this thing, it's like, how the hell are we going to do this? We're going to have to leave the drainage, you know, obviously. I'll tell you what, we do have an option. Here we are at the top of a cliff. It's not very high, but it's high enough that we have to use this vine to lower Cody down. So I got to fashion Cody a seat. This is what we're looking for right now. This will definitely support a 220-pound guy. Joe and I have developed the old seat method. 
Cut a branch, put it through a loop, and try to lower me down. It's the jungle. It's hot. You're on this Tarzan vine. You're looking down a cliff. You got your leg in a splint. What can't go wrong? This is effed up, man. Cody, any way you do this, it's going to be uncomfortable. The quicker we can do this and you get down, This is not... my deal up here. So just, I don't, I don't need banter from you right now. Some people can overcome their fears, and some people can't. Right now, Cody has got to overcome his fear. I can see in his eyes that he's very nervous about this. Go a little bit lower. Yep, let's this get this, full let's get this is... thing over with. Start dropping yep. me. Gotcha. Watch your slow, right. Slow, slow, slow. <sighs> I'm here. Yep, yep. Keep it coming. Yep. If I lose my grip right now, Cody's falling forward, and he's going to smash his head on these rocks. Now we're in a really, really bad position. <sighs> keep coming. Keep yep. coming. Keep coming. OK, I'm down. I feel my foot touch the ground, and I feel that the battle's mostly over. Let me get this thing off of you. I need to collect myself, tighten my splint up. We'll get our heads straight, and then we'll just hope there's no more little surprises like this on the way. Below the drainage trail, the terrain is more forgiving and allows for a much quicker descent, even with Cody's immobilized leg. Hey, Cody, I see an opening up here. And I think I see the lake. Oh, yeah. Let's go. The good thing is we are catching glimpses of the lake. So our goal is getting closer. The cup is being filled psychologically because you know you're reaching that destination. And that's a very potent cocktail. Wow. Cody, I see smoke down there. Look, right over top of these tree lines. Yeah. We're red hot, man. Yep. Not too much farther, brother. Let's do it. Hey, Joe, check it out. Hola! Hola! All right. <laughs> yeah. If you're out in the woods and you're injured and you're with someone else who's not injured, the teamwork play between the two of you will determine whether you live or die. Sight for sore eyes. It's like forging a steel link. If the two partners cooperate, that link is unbreakable, and it's strong. If the two parties get in conflict, that metal gets brittle and it shatters, and both of you may end up six feet under the ground. Hola. Hola. If you work together, stay focused, and work your plan, you're going to come out the other end. If you don't, Mother Nature is going to put you in your place. Hey, hola. How you doing? Hi, hola. 